Greetings. My name is Baron Maddock Arundel, and I am the Cornelian Herald for the Kingdom of Ethelmark, as well as Shrike Herald Extraordinaire, a uh, title given to me by the Kingdom of Kalantir following my tenure there as the Gold Falcon Principal Herald. Um, this is uh, part of my series on uh, heraldic consultation. Uh, you may have seen my companion video uh, where I talk about uh, consultation on names. Uh, this presentation is a consultation uh, on armory, which includes devices and badges. Uh, I did first present uh, this class in uh, November of 2019 at the Ethelmark Fall Academy. Uh, and had originally intended it uh, to be a presentation at Ethelmark's uh, Kingdom Heralds and Scribes. All right, we're going to spend about an hour and 15 minutes, uh, and we're going to be looking at several different factors. And if you have seen the companion video on name consultations, you will see some similarities and some information um, that is a repeat of uh, what I presented in that class. Um, however, because this class is also intended uh, to stand alone, I will be including that information. So we'll be looking at these four uh, topics. Uh, first, contact with a client, uh, online resources that are available, uh, some hard copy resources uh, that you might find useful, and a quick uh, look at how to check for conflict uh, on a device or badge once your client settles on a pattern or design. So uh, first contact uh, can occur in any number of ways. Uh, you might be uh, at a consult table, uh, set up in an event and uh, uh, populous members are coming up to talk to you. Uh, you might be working at the uh, Herald's Tent at Penzik or one of the other major wars around the SCA. Uh, you could just have people wander up to you because they happen to know you're a herald and start asking you questions about uh, submissions. Um, your client might be somebody that you know very well. Uh, it might be somebody that you have never previously met. Also, your client might be somebody who is familiar uh, with the rules for SCA heraldry, uh, with the concepts of heraldry in history. Uh, or um, your client could be somebody who's totally clueless. Uh, they may have uh, just gotten into the SCA. Uh, they may never have had any previous exposure uh, to heraldic design or heraldic practice, uh, but they've heard that uh, registering a name and, and uh, a device is a thing to do, and therefore they are coming to talk to you uh, about uh, the finer points. So I'm going to make the assumption uh, for the purpose of this presentation that your client is somebody who is coming up to you uh, in a formal consultation role uh, at, a, at a table or, or the Herald Stand or whatever, um, and that uh, it is somebody with whom you are not familiar and it is somebody who is uh, not knowledgeable on the practice of SCA or period heraldry. So when you get that first contact uh, with a client, uh, one of the first things that you want to do is you want to get a feel for the designs that they might find appealing. And uh, sometimes they will come up to you and they'll have a sketch or they'll have an idea of what they're looking for. Uh, they might have a color scheme. Uh, they might have uh, ideas on the types of charges that they want to use. Uh, but it's just as likely that they're going to come up to you with the question, what is a device and how do I get one? So uh, one of the first things that you need to do uh, with uh, any new client is you need to get to know a little bit about them. So you can do this by asking them questions. Uh, you can ask them questions about their persona. Do they have a particular time period in history uh, that they are attempting to emulate? Are they looking for a specific culture um, or even on a narrower focus, a specific country um, in that time period in history? Or are they looking for a country and they're un unconcerned about the time period? 
Um, if your client is uh, not sure about the answer to these questions, maybe they haven't built a persona uh, as yet, maybe they haven't uh, fleshed out their persona's backstory, um, they may, may or may not even have a registered name at this point in time, then you can start asking them some general questions in order to get a feel uh, for uh, what options uh, you might uh, be presenting to them. So I ask them about things like their favorite colors. Uh, do they prefer light colors or dark colors? Um, do they have a particular color pattern uh, that they're involved in? I, I know several people uh, who had military backgrounds uh, that uh, were particularly fond of the color scheme associated with their, uh, their military service, uh, blue and white for uh, Air Force people, blue and yellow for Navy people. Uh, yellow and green for army people. Um, but uh, just as uh, often run into people who have uh, favorite colors for any other number of reasons. Uh, do they have any preferred charges that they may be looking at? Um, animals, plants, or stationary objects? Um, I have uh, actually consulted with clients uh, who had a favorite pet that they wanted to have represented uh, in their armory. Um, and geometric patterns. They're uh, particularly with some of the uh, Asian styles of heraldry, geometric patterns play a particular uh, role in heraldic design. Uh, but there are geometric patterns that are very, very common uh, in other parts of the world as well. Um, and not only uh, geometric shapes, uh, for instance, a lozenge or, or a billet or a rondelle, um, but patterns where you have other charges that are in um, a, uh, a lozenge pattern, laid out in a lozenge pattern, or laid out in a circular pattern? Uh, are, are they looking for anything particular about that? Basically, any question at all um, where you can uh, get a feel for, um, for, for what they, they might enjoy. Um, also, under, uh, under preferred charges, you might ask them what types of activities in the SCA they enjoy. Um, do they, uh, are they particularly fond of archery? Or are they particularly fond of uh, nighttime reveling? Are they particularly fond of uh, equestrian activities? Are they merchants? Are they musicians? Um, there are all sorts of, of questions about uh, their druthers in the SCA that can be used to contribute to ideas uh, for heraldic design. Now, the other thing about first contact is remember that your client knows almost as much about you as you know about them. Um, and therefore, uh, you need to be able to set expectations. Um, and not just expectations about what you as the consulting herald are able to do for them, but it's, it's up to you uh, to ensure that your client is at least uh, exposed to uh, the basic rules of SCA heraldry as you work through the de design process. Um, not only does it, does it uh, help with uh, developing designs, but it also forestalls uh, a lot of the questions or arguments one gets uh, when a client starts uh, uh, getting adamant about something that is actually not permitted in the rules. If you've set expectations up front, it's less likely that you're going to have conflict during the consultation. Um, so uh, after ascertaining the level of knowledge and experience of, of my client, um, I generally start with uh, at least a basic uh, concept of what is involved in SCA heraldry. So um, explaining the colors, uh, the five colors, the two metals, and uh, the two different kinds of furs. Um, there are, of course, a variety of furs, but uh, the two different kinds, the ermine style furs, uh, where it's a uh, metal or color background uh, with a sprinkling of uh, ermine spots, um, or the neutral furs, uh, which are the ones like Ver uh, or Potenty, uh, where the uh, layout of the, the field itself is a blend of a color and a metal. Um, and I talk about uh, the rules of contrast and how 
colors, metals, and furs fit into uh, those rules. Uh, one thing I always stress with any consultation that I'm doing is that your device does not need to be a resume. Um, I have had clients who've come up to me and said, uh, well, I'm a fighter, so I want a sword or an ax uh, on my device. Um, I like uh, partying, so I'd like to have a mug or a goblet. Um, I shoot archery, so I wanna have arrows. Um, and, and they'll list off about four or five different activities that they are involved in in the SCA. And they want each one of those activities represented uh, on their device. And we'll get into uh, some of the SCA rules that discourage this type of, of design. Uh, but it's also important to explain uh, that regardless of what activities an individual is involved in, the purpose of armory is not to tell your story. Uh, the purpose of armory is to identify you. And uh, simple designs uh, being generally uh, better designs from a heraldic perspective. Um, but that the other thing is that, that, that very simply, uh, when we get into the complexities of armorial design, uh, we have a limit on how complex that we can get. I briefly uh, talk about what's called the Instaboying Checklist. Uh, this is a checklist that was put together by um, Mr. Chael of Armida, uh, who is a former Laurel Sovereign of Arms. And generally, um, it addresses what we call the core style rules. Um, regardless of the fact that the SCA caters uh, to pretty much any uh, medieval and pre-medieval uh, culture around the world, the core style rules uh, for SCA heraldic design uh, are the uh, Norman Anglo uh, rules uh, of heraldry, um, pretty much um, uh, centered around uh, the middle 15th century. Uh, 1485 uh, was establishment of the uh, College of Arms in England, and uh, uh, generally the core style rules follow that Anglo-Norman uh, design culture uh, from around that time period. There are, of course, exceptions to the core style rules that are permitted in the core style rules. Um, and uh, uh, in general, uh, exceptions to those core style rules are permitted uh, when they can be justified through what's called an individually attested pattern. Uh, so what exactly is an individually attested pattern? Well, um, it is a research and presentation of evidence that a particular heraldic design was prevalent in period outside of the Anglo-Norman uh, heraldic culture. And why would you need one? Well, you would need one if you wanted to violate the core style rules. For instance, one of your core style rules is color does not go on color, metal does not go on metal. Um, however, uh, if we look at uh, some uh, cultures uh, in the Middle Ages, we can see that in German culture, it is not unusual for red on black or black on red uh, to be part of their heraldic design. Uh, Eastern European culture, we see other examples of color on color, uh, with one of the more prevalent being red on blue or blue on red. Um, yellow and white uh, overlaying each other uh, can be found in Italian heraldry. Uh, and of course, uh, there are charges that are generally uh, not permitted SCA-wide uh, from uh, Asian heraldry, uh, particular, uh, particularly Japanese uh, or Chinese heraldry, um, that can be uh, well documented uh, using sources from those cultures. So if you want to violate the core style rules, uh, you do have to put together what's called an individually attested pattern. And what that means is, uh, you need to find multiple examples of each element of your heraldic design if one element violates a core style rule. Um, so if you wanted a, uh, a per pale field um, with a lion uh, and you wanted it uh, red and black and you wanted the lion to be black and red across the pale line, uh, you would have to give a certain number of examples of uh, a per pale field, 
um, in, and I'm going to use German heraldry, uh, a purple field in German heraldry, of uh, lions used in German heraldry, and of both red on black and black on red in German heraldry. And you would have to show them all uh, to be uh, present in the same geographical region during the same time period. Uh, so even though uh, having a field divided per pale uh, sable and jewels is part of core style rules, because you want to counter change the lion over it, um, which violates the core style rules, you still have to show that the practice that is violating the core style uh, was in use at the same time as the pattern that did not uh, violate the core style. Um, I could give an entire class just on individually attested patterns, uh, so that's about as far as I will go into it here. Um, in general, you uh, get a client that will uh, want to attempt an individually attested pattern uh, probably less than 5% of the time. Um, but uh, again, uh, that would be a separate class, and so we will go into that in more detail later. So what do the Instaboing rules tell us? Well, first of all, you can't submit a device or a badge without having a registered SCA name. So first rule, does the submitter have an SCA name? If they do, is it already registered? Or are we going to attempt to document that name and submit it at the same time as the armory submission? Um, you also need to make sure that your client is aware that if they are submitted at the same time and the name does not pass, that even if the armory uh, is registrable, it cannot be registered uh, without that registered SCA name. Does the submission violate the rule of tincture, color on color or metal on metal? And of course, I use the example of how an IAP uh, can uh, allow uh, an exception to that rule. Is the submission slot machine? Uh, slot machine is a term we use in SCA heraldry that refers to um, excessive numbers of different types of charges within a charge group. So uh, we talk about the primary, the secondary, the tertiary charge groups. Um, and I won't go into the definitions of those because if you're taking this class, you should be familiar with those terms. Um, but what slot machine is, is where you have three or more different charges within the same charge group. Uh, so for instance, it's, it's very common to have three of the same charge uh, in the primary charge group. For instance, Jules, uh, three tigers or um, the heraldic tiger um, being displayed uh, three times uh, in a particular pattern on that red field. Um, however, Jules, uh, a lion, a tiger, and a bear, even though it's the same principle, three animals, even though it's the same uh, colors, uh, gold on red, uh, even though it's the same arrangement, uh, whether that be in pale and fest two and one, whatever, um, that second example would not be allowed because a lion, a tiger, and a bear are three different charges. And so just like the three different uh, windows on a slot machine uh, coming up with, with uh, different symbols, uh, and that's, you know, you don't win when that happens on a slot machine. Um, you can't push that through uh, as, uh, as a, uh, an armory pattern. Is it marshaled? Uh, marshaling uh, refers to the practice of shoving the uh, arms of the father and mother together into a single armorial design. Uh, and it generally takes uh, the form uh, one of three ways. Uh, impaled arms are where you take um, the dad's arm, sorry, the dad's arms and the mom's arms and you put them together in a in a side by side pattern divided by a uh, a per pale uh, line of division. Um, the other way, uh, more most common way, is quarterly, where you have the dad's arms in the upper left corner and the lower right corner, and the mother's arms in the upper right and lower left corner. Um, so quartered arms are also uh, considered marshaled when the same pattern appears in 
those diagonal quarters. And then third, much less, um, uh, much less prolific is um, what's called arms of pretense. Um, this is where you have the big shield uh, with the father's arms, and then in the center you have a smaller shield uh, called an escutcheon uh, with the arms of the other parent uh, on the escutcheon. Um, while marshalling is a very common form of heraldic display in the SCA, uh, it is not something that the SCA College of Arms will register uh, to an individual. So if there's the appearance, even the appearance of marshaled armory, um, it, it can be kicked back. Does it use a forbidden charge or group of charges? Um, the SCA has ruled a number of different charges as being um, uh, forbidden in the SCA. Uh, some of them because they are associated with particularly famous historical figures. Uh, for instance, a three-toed uh, uh, three -toed oriental dragon, uh, which is um, generally associated with uh, royal families in Asia, uh, is forbidden uh, to use in the SCA. Uh, the fil fought uh, as a, uh, a symbol of good fortune in multiple cultures, uh, Norse, uh, Hindu, etc., cetera, um, is a forbidden charge uh, because another word for fil fought is swastika. And the fact that the swastika um, has become identified uh, with the uh, Third Reich of the Nazi Party of 1930s and 40s uh, Central Europe, um, it is actually a forbidden charge. So if there is a forbidden charge um, that needs to be removed or replaced uh, before the device can go forward. Um, what about restricted charges? Restricted charges are a little bit different from forbidden charges in that a restricted charge is permitted in SCA heraldry, but it has to be something that the holder of the armory is entitled to display. Um, the, probably the best example of a restricted charge would be a crown or coronet of any type, um, which is restricted to uh, people who have earned the right to wear a crown or coronet um, in their persona. So somebody is given a court barony uh, or becomes a viscount, uh, count, countess, uh, duke, duchess, uh, whatever, uh, because they are entitled to wear that coronet uh, in persona, they are also entitled to include a coronet uh, in their armory. Um, and certainly uh, there are other items on the restricted charge list. Many of them are associated uh, with regalia uh, for various peerage orders. Uh, so for instance, a uh, uh, golden loop of chain uh, or a uh, pelican vulning itself uh, are, are restricted charges uh, for the order of chivalry and the order of the pelican uh, respectively. Uh, so if you, uh, if you have a restricted charge uh, on the uh, submission, uh, you need to uh, attest to the fact that the individual is actually entitled uh, to use that charge. Uh, complexity is a tough issue to judge. Um, you know, we're 50 years into the SCA College of Arms here, and we still have people that argue uh, the rules of complexity. Um, very simply stated, complexity is determined by the sum total of different charges and different tinctures in a device or badge. Uh, so the best way to do that is to say that we count one for each different color and we count one for each different charge. So for example, my arms are or an acorn within oak leaves and annulo vert. Uh, so what I have is I have the gold shield and in the center I have a very large acorn uh, a green acorn, and then around it, I have seven oak leaves uh, in a circular pattern that are also green. So I have a complexity count of four. Uh, I have two charges, I have oak leaves and I have acorns, and I have two colors, I have yellow and I have green. So two colors, two charges, uh, two charge types, that's a complexity of four. Uh, the SCA, as a rule, allows uh, no more than eight 
on the complexity count. Um, if you go above eight, uh, the College of Arms will look at the device and see if it appears too complex. Um, and of course, they will accept uh, individually attested patterns uh, regarding complexity, although uh, IAPs for complexity are extremely difficult to put together. Um, and where the argument generally comes up is um, on, on certain items like uh, flames, uh, which are generally uh, multiple color, but very little of each. So um, if you have um, an inflamed charge where you have little licks of yellow and red flame, um, the flame is obviously going to count as a charge, um, but um, because it's described as proper, is that um, you know one tincture or two, red and yellow. Um, if if the flame is uh, little bits of very tiny flame, um, integral to a charge. For instance, a salamander appears inflamed by default. Um, is the flame in fact counted as a sustained charge? or is it counted as part of uh, the salamander? Uh, and these are questions that, uh, that get asked and argued pretty much every time one of those uh, charges goes up. But um, in general, uh, most people will come well under the complexity count of eight uh, in their heraldic designs. Uh, in general, if you go over eight, it's probably one of these other uh, issues that's driving it. Um, or they're trying to use their, their armory as a resume. So um, you can generally resolve the complexity issue by resolving the other issues. Bumpity lines, any complex line, um, indented, uh, invected, and grailed, wavy, um, whatever that complex line is, um, when it's drawn onto the submission sheet, the, the bumpity parts need to be big and bold. Um, there are a number of, of heraldic artists out there that have found uh, templates uh, either at uh, office supply stores or in the school supply aisle uh, at some of the uh, big box stores. Um, in fact, I actually have a few templates that I still use that I bought years ago. Uh, one of them manufactured by Crayola, of all things. Uh, one of the issues with some of these templates is that they're designed for uh, use on elementary school art artwork, um, and they may work uh, for the uh, miniature uh, versions of the arms that are put out in the submission sheet or in the uh, uh, online system for commenting and response. But when you you get to the the big five and a half inch shield uh, that we are designing our arms on for the submission sheet, a lot of times the template is just too small. Um, the bumps are not big and bold enough to be seen easily um, on the submission sheet uh, at the uh, prescribed distance. So um, make sure, uh, regardless of how the individual wants to display their arms, make sure that uh, when it's drawn out on a submission sheet that the bumps are big and bold and easily identifiable. Last but not least, all charges need to be drawn in their medieval form. Uh, we are first and foremost a historical society and uh, while the modern aesthetic tends to lean towards the modern or natural view of a lot of heraldic charges, most of them have a period form and um, the period form needs to be the one that is actually submitted. Um, now I talk a lot about devices but uh, badges are also part of armorial consultation. Um, and there are two types of badges. There are fielded badges and there are field list badges. And what's the difference between the two? Well, fielded badges follow all the exact same rules as a device. Each person can only register one device with their, with their name, but they can have up to five badges. And uh, what would I use a fielded badge for? Well, You'd use it for anything you wanted to. Uh, a lot of people will register a fielded badge with an alternate persona name um, because the, the one device, one person rule is by person. So if I have an alternate persona and I want that alternate persona to have distinctive 
uh, heraldry, I might register a fielded badge as an alternate device. Um, I, I might also use it uh, as a uh, uh, identifying mark. Uh, if it's something related to, uh, uh, to me uh, or associated uh, with me uh, by the populace at large, uh, any badge can be used as an identifying mark. Um, although when we start talking about using them for identifying marks, uh, in general, we would be more suited to look at field list badges. A fieldless badge is essentially the same as any other badge or device with one big exception. It doesn't have a background color. And because it doesn't have a background color, it follows slightly different rules. Uh, the first rule is uh, the conflict rule. In order for Armory to be clear of conflict, it has to have two distinct changes from any other piece of Armory out there. Uh, it can have one substantial change, but uh, in general, we look for those two DCs. A fieldless badge automatically gets one DC for a difference in the field. A fieldless badge is different from every other uh, piece of armory by one count for lack of a field. The second rule is that all charges on a fieldless badge must touch. And the reason for this is because it doesn't have a field and the field theoretically holds the design together. So without having that field holding the design together, uh, all the charges in a fieldless badge need to touch. And if you think about it, uh, think of yourself casting a fieldless badge out of pewter. Um, and if the charges are not touching, uh, then when you take that pewter cast, uh, the, each individual charge uh, stands by itself without the other charges associated with it. Um, fieldless badges, much more often used as uh, sort of a logo or a maker's mark or just a, a, a tag that somebody can stick on an item that they own uh, that identifies it as theirs. Um, the whole concept of uh, marking something as your own uh, flows right from fieldless badges. One very common uh, period use would have been uh, to mark livery uh, for people who were employees or subjects of a particular noble. Um, they might wear a, a, a tabard or some other form of livery uh, with a fieldless badge uh, marked on the, uh, on the clothing. So what are some resources we can look at? We, we, we've gone through the rules, we've gone through the expectations, and now we're taking our client into the actual design. Uh, what are some sources that they can look at uh, to help them figure out what it is that they want to register. And the best is probably the period rolls of arms. Now, I believe if I click on this, I can actually go through. Um, the Office of the uh, Laurel Sovereign of Arms uh, has a very extensive website at heraldry.sca.org. And as you can see uh, from the uh, across the menu, here, there are a variety of uh, different um, sections that you can go to. And one of those is articles. And what I like about articles is there's articles on literally everything uh, to do with heraldry. There's articles on names, there's articles on devices, there's articles on administrative practices, uh, there's historical articles, there's uh, opinion pieces. And one of uh, the articles under Armory is a section talking about the period roles of arms. Period roles are where you had some activity or some region or something that, that uh, uh, they wanted a, uh, an attendance roster essentially entered into um, the archives. And heraldry was one of the most common ways uh, to do this. So you can see where they talk. Uh, extensively about uh, heraldic arms, and then they, they give you the names of some of them. Uh, these are what's called tournament roles, uh, which was all of the nobles that participated in a tournament. And uh, while there are no links to click through on these, they do give you all of the library information that you need 
uh, to go out and um, search out these uh, volumes uh, at booksellers or uh, libraries uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but we also have links to actual um, online armorials. So, you know, let's take a look at uh, one of these links where they actually have uh, scans of period artwork um, online. Um, some of it is uh, scriptorial uh, marginalia, uh, which includes uh, heraldry. Some of it is uh, actual roles. Some of it is uh, uh, private, uh, privately uh, contracted artwork. And you can see the displays of armory uh, in these various uh, rolls of arms. Um, here's a, oops, looks like that one's a dead link. Oh, that one's also a dead link. Wow. We'll have to get on the horn to uh, Laurel. Uh, booksellers, uh, things like that. So um, so that's uh, uh, one online example, of course, being um, any of the articles at heraldry.sca.org. Uh, some other ones, uh, Lars Daughter, um, Medieval and Renaissance Culture. Here's a list of a number of rolls of arms uh, from, uh, here's one, uh, Wappenbuch, uh, that's an armorial, uh, Der Österreichischen Herzoge, uh, Austrian Dukes. So we have, uh, ooh, the, the arms of an Austrian duke. Uh, the Manas Codex. Oh, look at this one. All kinds of plates of different nobility showing the arms in the corner. So you can navigate through that. Um, page from the 15th century armorial with four coats of arms. Um, there's four actual uh, Germanic coats of arms. And that's a black and white scan as opposed to a colored scan. But uh, the Zurich roll, um, this one is broken out into strips. But you can see it's actual uh, arms of people living in Zurich uh, during that period in time. Um, so very, very uh, useful links. Siebmacher's Wappenbuch, 1605, probably the foremost uh, book used um, for German arms. And you can see that uh, uh, it's very extensive with regards to the various armorial depictions that it gives. Um, and then Viking Answer Lady, uh, one of my favorite sources, who also has a, an extensive collection of online uh, armorials. Uh, some of them that are available, ooh, look at this. Uh, these are photographs taken of actual rolls of arms that are in the British Museum. Uh, so you can walk your uh, client through uh, some of these online resources, and there's literally hundreds of them out there. Uh, which is why it's very, very important uh, to try to use the, uh, the persona story uh, and the uh, getting to know you uh, part of the consultation to narrow down the scope. Um, if I'm chasing a Spanish persona, I'm certainly not going to uh, be wanting to look at the German armorials. Uh, I'm going to want to look at something uh, from the Iberian Peninsula. So. Um, one other online resource, uh, this one um, is called uh, uh, Bruce Draconarius and Mistholm's Pictorial Dictionary of Heraldry. Uh, Bruce uh, Draconarius and Mistholm is a uh, former Laurel Sovereign of Arms, and he's probably got 50 years of, of uh, experience, uh, easily 40 years, uh, because uh, he was an old herald when I joined the SCA 30-some-odd uh, years ago. Um, but he has actually done significant amount, amounts of research uh, on uh, period charges. And his Pictorial Dictionary of Heraldry, uh, which is affectionately known 
as the PICDIC, um, is an archive of specific charges used in period heraldry. And one of the reasons I, uh, um, I like this, let's look up insects, is first of all, his artwork is accepted by the College of Arms because the depictions that he has put here of charges are taken from actual period sources. Uh, so he shows, uh, for instance, a period butterfly, a period spider. It means that art was taken from a period source. Now down here it says scarab and dragonfly accepted. Uh, accepted means that the SCA has accepted that depiction as being adequate uh, for the submitted artwork on the device. And he tells you a little bit about it. The term insect refers to any bug type creature. Um, examples found in period heraldry, including the ant called an emmet, um, the beetle found in the arms of Teufel, uh, and then he references the plates, Gwillem, uh, one, volume one, page 151, or plate 151, Seedmacher, plate 42. Uh, the butterfly, also called a papillon, found in the uh, arms of uh, Burning Hill uh, around 1410, uh, shows you the armorial information, so on and so forth. The other thing is that when you get down to the bottom, it says the illustrations show butterfly, spider, scarab, and dragonfly, all are in their default positions uh, for specific entries CB and scorpion. But then he goes on to list um, people that currently have uh, those charges on their devices. Now, in this case, uh, it, it looks as though all of the ones he has listed here are SCA people. But um, he will tell you as well um, people in actual period. Uh, it's found like Scorpion, it's found in the canon arms of De Scorpionis, uh, middle 15th century, and the arms of Cole, uh, circa 1520. So he does give you examples of where the, uh, the charges are found. So uh, the PICDIC is an absolute essential uh, online resource for any consultation. Um, one other source, and this is strictly for artwork, uh, is what's called the Pensic Traceable Art Project. And this page here um, is uh, the link out to uh, Pensic Traceable Art uh, from the Ethel Mark Herald's uh, website. Um, I don't have a hot link to it, um, so I can't click through to it. But essentially, what Pensic Traceable Art is, is um, when we do consultations at Penzik, we have the Herald's tent. Customer comes in, they consult with the naming Heralds, they consult with the Armory Heralds, uh, whatever they pick up. The Armory gets sent back to, there's a second tent in the back, and that's where the artists are sitting. And the artists work hard every year by taking the rough drawing and the description of what the client has uh, said is their uh, preferred Armory and they create a submission form in both color and black and white for them uh, to take home with them and uh, um, submit uh, or just for them to take a look at get a copy of and then they can actually uh, pay right there at Penzik and have it submitted uh, through the Herald's Tent at Penzik. But uh, we found out that the artists were getting overwhelmed and so in an effort to uh, make the artist's job a little easier, um, they created, they, they took the standard depictions of charges and they created them in several different sizes, depending on whether it's a primary charge, a secondary or tertiary, depending on whether there's a single or multiple, depending on uh, whether it's uh, on a field with other charges or whether it's on a field by itself. So there's like seven or eight different sizes of each depiction. And if you look in here, broken out by alphabet, there are literally um, thousands of charges uh, with multiple uh, sizes and multiple postures and orientations um, that are included in here that the artist can download and then uh, just trace onto the submission sheet. Um, now, I will give you a couple of caveats uh, with use in the Penzik Traceable Art Project. Uh, one is every once in a while, something that's in the traceable art is ruled no longer compatible with SCA heraldry, uh, usually on the basis of new 
uh, historical research, um, or sometimes on the basis of a charge being identified as a restricted or uh, prohibited charge. Uh, when that happens, it's not always removed from the traceable art. And the best example I can think of right now is the flame. Uh, if you look in the traceable art at what constitutes a flame, uh, you'll see what's commonly called the crab claw style uh, flame, uh, which is you know kind of shaped like a crab claw with little wick, licks of flame coming off uh, the top of it. Um, no longer compatible with SCA heraldry. Uh, they are now insisting on period depictions of flame, um, which are somewhat different. And there is a period depiction of a flame in the Penzik traceable art. But when they, uh, when they do that, they don't re necessarily remove the artwork right away. It can stay uh, in there for, for quite a long time. So if you looked in the uh, traceable art project right now, you would still find that crab claw uh, flame. Um, even though it is no longer uh, accepted. Uh, but a great resource for drawing things out. Uh, hard copy resources, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. Um, they're hard copy, so I don't have links to them online. Uh, but I will tell you that the bulk of the ones listed here um, are what we call uh, pictorials or uh, discussions of the art of heraldry. Uh, there's not a lot of documentation uh, for period design uh, incorporated in um, in these volumes, um, but they uh, they are excellent uh, for showing examples of accepted uh, period art uh, period heraldry in the real world. Um, I will also tell you that most kingdom libraries are going to have uh, a number of these available. So if you don't have them uh, and you can't afford to purchase them, don't sweat it. Um, your kingdom submissions deputy probably has a box in their front hallway uh, that they haven't opened for uh, a couple of years uh, that uh, probably contains uh, one or more of, of these references. Um, I know, for example, I have available to me uh, Brault Foster, Fox Davies, at least one of the two friars, and a Neubecker, um, either in my personal library or in the Kingdom Library. Um, there are a couple of these, the Oxford Guide to Heraldry, uh, Heraldry Customs Rules and Styles, for example, that will go into period design, uh, but for the most part, uh, you're looking at period artwork, or you're looking at heraldic artwork. Sources to avoid. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. I'm not gonna name every source, I should say. Um, there is an appendix in the SCA uh, Herald's uh, Administrative Handbook, which is av available at heraldry.sca.org um, of sources to not use for heraldic design. Um, and it could be a variety of reasons. Uh, it could be um, post-period sources, it could be uh, that the source is discredited, uh, it could be just the lack of proper dating uh, of the heraldic design or the, or the uh, heraldic uh, uh, depictions. Um, the one that I will mention is the one depicted right here in the, um, on the slide, uh, Charles Norton Elvin, a Dictionary of Heraldry. Um, I will tell you that I have a copy of Elvin and it is a wonderful book uh, to look in uh, to get ideas. It is not a wonderful book to use for documentation that a particular charge or style was being used in period. And the reason for that is this was published, I believe in 1906 or 1908 uh, for the, the copy that I have. Um, but Charles, Charles Elvin, um, relied extremely heavily on the rules of heraldry in England during the reign of Queen Victoria. And Victorian heraldry represented probably the single largest step away from medieval heraldic design uh, of any other change in history. Uh, so there uh, are examples of all sorts of variations 
of chevrons and pales and borders uh, that you can find uh, plates of in Elvin, uh, none of which are compatible uh, with uh, period heraldic design and therefore not acceptable by the College of Arms. Uh, there are a number of uh, the, the plant and animal charges tend to be much more naturalistically depicted rather than medieval heraldically depicted. Uh, and so it's, it's not a great source uh, for artwork. <clears throat> so you've completed the consultation and you're gonna get around to building the actual submission. Um, this is the form and the form is actually designed by the Laurel office. Um, the one change that we in the kingdoms are allowed to make is we're allowed to put our name up here in the corner um, and we're allowed to make some minor changes to some of the footer information here. But the main body of the form, we are not allowed to make any changes to. Uh, it's a standardized form across the SCA. Uh, the escutcheon um, or the square for badge submissions um, are standard sizes so that uh, when we go to scan the electronic submission forms uh, into the electronic database, um, everything is a standard size, standard shape, and with information in a standard format. Uh, so for individuals, there are uh, three different forms. There's the device form, which looks like this, the badge form, where this is a square, and then a fieldless badge, where it's still a square, but it's a dotted line indicating that the field does not actually exist. Uh, for groups, um, it is a slightly, diff slightly different header information when it's a group. And by group, we mean uh, official SCA groups. So kingdoms, principalities, baronies, shires. Um, they also have their own device form, their own badge form, their own fieldless badge form. But they have something that individuals do not, and that is the petition requirement. And the petition requirement is, uh, say you start up a new shire, uh, you got 10 people in the shire, and uh, you decide that uh, uh, you want to register the Shire's arms. When you send in the group's device uh, registration form, it has to be accompanied by a petition signed by a majority of the members of the Shire saying that, yes, this is in fact the design that they want. Um, so, uh, uh, and we'll see under administrative issues where that's one of the biggest problems with group submissions. Now, what are some administrative issues we find that you as the Consulting Herald um, can prevent? Well, missing information on the forms. Um, if you look, uh, there's a whole bunch of information up here and some of it people go, well, why do I need to include that? Why do I need to put my date of birth? Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't know. Um, it could be a holdover from days gone by. It could be the tiebreaker. Um, and uh, if two people submit the same device at the same time, it, you know, that maybe the older person gets it uh, first. I don't know. Um, and to be quite honest, I've never asked, called up anybody and said, hey, you left this blank. But for this other stuff, when we look at it, I need to have your society name, your legal name. Uh, and then I need to have at least one means of contacting you. So we asked for a street address, a phone number, and an email address. Um, give me two of the three. Because I've had a lot of people that have just given me their email address. And by the time I get back to them six months later uh, to tell them that their submission has passed, uh, they quit using that ISP and, and the email address doesn't work anymore. Uh, give me at least two ways to contact you. Um, Consulting Herald, guess what? Not only your name as the Consulting Herald, but give me your email address as well, because I'm going to CC you on any correspondence with your client. As the Consulting Herald, you're going to be the one they come back to uh, when there's an issue. So let me know how to contact you as well. And oh, by the way, make sure I can read it. Make sure it's legible. Another big issue, all these little check boxes. Um, is your name already registered, submitted with this device, uh, or previously submitted uh, and not yet, not yet registered? You know, maybe your name went up on last month's letter and your device is going up on this month. 
um, is this a new submission, a resubmission? If it's a resubmission, was it kicked back by Kingdom or Laurel previously? Uh, is it a change? Do you already have a registered device and you want to change it? If you do, do you want to release your old device or do you want to keep your old device as a badge? Check the right boxes. If I don't have this information, I might be kicking it back to you and saying I need that info before this can go forward. Don't use an outdated form. Uh, the Laurel office updates the forms periodically. When they do, they put a date uh, on the, the bottom of the form. And they give us about uh, anywhere from six months to a year um, in transition where the old form is still usable. But after that time, if you're still using an outdated form a year later, they're gonna kick it back to you uh, to get it onto the proper form. Uh, right there in the middle, failure to include the populist petitions on a group submission. Um, if you don't have the petition, uh, they don't even look at the submission. They just send it straight back to you. Uh, missing payments or payments not matching. Uh, if you look at the submissions page on the Ethelmark College of Heralds page, uh, you find that it is $6 per element to submit to the College of Arms. So uh, it's $6 to submit a name, $6 to submit a device, $6 to submit a badge. I have received packages where I have a name and device and a check for $6. If it's a name and device, I need a check for $12. And what I will generally do is I will contact you and say, um, do you want to send the other $6? Do you want me to send this back to you? And you send it back to me with $12. Um, if I don't hear back from you, I'm going to send the name up because I have to have a registered name to get the registered heraldry. And then I'm going to bounce your heraldry back to you. Uh, payments not matching the clients. Um, the issue there, it used to be acceptable for a consulting herald to collect cash from the customer, uh, deposit that cash into a Shire account, and have the Shire write a check. That is no longer permitted. Due to changes in the Exchequer um, Administrative Handbook, uh, we can no longer launder um, submission money through the local group's uh, checking accounts. We cannot launder it through the Consulting Herald's checking account. So you cannot take money from a client and write a check on that client's behalf. The client has to write the check or hand over a money order. The College of Arms will not accept cash. Um, now, an exception to that, a parent can write a check for a child. A husband or wife can write a check for their spouse but the check cannot be written out by a third party on behalf of the client. Um, and then boxes checked without explanation. The biggest example of that is right here where it says uh, it's a resubmission. They'll check the resubmission block. Uh, they'll leave the Laurel or Kingdom block unchecked and they won't tell me why down here. Uh, they won't tell me why it was returned the last time and I have to go dig that out of the archives. Um, they check the change block, but they don't tell me whether they want to retain the old device as a badge or release it. So um, give me, if you check a box, make sure that the uh, explanation uh, accompanying that box is also checked. Uh, some other problems, uh, black and white. By the way, black and white does not mean black and white. Black and white means line art, line art, an outline of the device or badge. Um, the outline needs to match the color and black and white copies. They have to be the same. I have had people who've sent me a color copy uh, without the line art. I get back to them, I go, hey, I need a black and white of it. Um, and they do one of two things. Uh, they either Xerox the, the color copy um, in a black and white setting on the printer and it comes out shades of gray. That's coming back to you. Or they will slap a blank sheet down on top of the color copy and they'll attempt to trace uh, the outline uh, through the sheet. Can work, but not always. Best thing to do is when you do the original artwork, make multiple copies of it so that if you screw up a colored copy, you've got spares. Um, always keep the original artwork as line art. Never color in the original artwork. And that way you always have a master uh, to make more copies. But the black and white form has to exactly match the color form uh, as far as the outline 
uh, line art is concerned. Charge is not drawn in a period style. We've beat that horse. Uh, failure to use the heraldic version of colors. I get several uh, submissions uh, where they use a yellow highlighter uh, for the or portions, um, or they will use colored pencil or crayon. Um, they come out very, very off. Uh, when we go to scan those forms, um, uh, the colors don't always come through correctly. I had one just last month uh, where the, the yellow was so faded out um, that uh, the, the scanner actually recognized it as white. And it was only when I, when I got down to, hey, it says or in the blazon, but it looks white on the, on the copy. And um, the, uh, the client said, no, no, it's actually colored in. It's just very faint. So I slapped it into Photoshop and I, I started uh, messing with the color scheme in Photoshop. Sure enough, uh, there was a faint hint of yellow there, um, enough that you can see it uh, on the electronic copy now. Um, but there's a very good chance that that's going to actually get bounced back because it's not, uh, it's not using the heraldic version of yellow. Um, best thing I can tell you is if you're working electronically, use the 16-bit color wheel. And if you're working with magic markers, uh, Crayola brand is widely touted as the standard for SCA heraldry. Uh, quaternary charges. Now you're heralds, so you should know what a primary, secondary, and tertiary charge is. A quaternary charge is a charge on top of a tertiary. It's a fourth layer. So field, primary charge, secondary charge, um, tertiary charge, quaternary charge. Not allowed, except in very limited circumstances, usually involving an augmentation of arms. Um, if there's a quaternary charge, it's going to get kicked back. Uh, improper use of voiding or fimbriation. Uh, voiding is where you hollow out the center of a charge and uh, just leaving the outline. Fimbriation is where you do a uh, thick outline in a different tincture around an existing charge. Uh, both of them are very, uh, uh, well, both of them are, are known in period heraldry, and both of them are uh, um, fairly common ways uh, to get uh, color combinations that may not otherwise be allowed under core rules. Uh, the key with proper use of voiding and fimbriation, though, is it can only be done with the most simple of charges. Uh, geometric shapes, um, uh, in the case of fim uh, fimbriation, uh, central ordinaries, uh, that sort of thing. Improper use is where you, if you were trying to void a lion rampant or fimbriate um, a sun, um, that would be improper use of voiding or fimbriation because you're trying to do it uh, to charges that are way too complex. Uh, last but not least, if the charge is, is drawn uh, to a point where I look at it and I cannot tell what the charge is, uh, this is particularly uh, a problem with plants and animals. Uh, if I can't tell that it's a cat and not a dog, um, it's, it's going to come back to you for a redraw. Style issues, obtrusively modern. The number of times that somebody has tried to register Green Lantern's logo. Um, the, the one that I really liked was the guy that tried to register the Dalek um, from, from Doctor Who. Um, certain patterns that wind up looking like uh, uh, Deadpool's mask. Uh, where the pattern is heraldically acceptable, but the overall impression is obtrusively modern. Um, if it looks like, um, if it looks 20th century uh, enough that it pulls somebody out of a medieval mindset, it's considered obtrusively modern, it'll come back. Overly naturalistic, uh, there are uh, two ways that this could be a factor. Uh, one is animals or plants that are drawn in their natural versus heraldic style, uh, but it could also be what's called landscaping. 
and in landscaping, it's where the overall heraldic design looks too much like um, the painting or photograph of a landscape um, rather than an actual heraldic uh, pattern, and uh, that'll get kicked back. Overly cartoonish. Uh, if you want Bill the Cat being run over by a couple of uh, uh, tires, um, that's great. But submit an heraldic cat displayed overall two pallets sable. Uh, do not submit Bill the Cat with a couple of tire tread marks uh, across um, his uh, displayed arms. Um, if it looks like a cartoon, it's coming back. Uh, overall charges, uh, this is a charge that lays over other charges on the field. So it's partially on other charges and it's partially on the field. Barely overall is when there's not enough of it directly on the field. An overall charge is judged for contrast against the, the field. So if the field's a color, the overall charge is a metal and vice versa. If it's barely overall, that means more of it is actually up against uh, the other charges, which are themselves going to be uh, metals. And um, therefore it's a poor style. Uh, if you do an individually attested pattern and you haven't met all the criteria, it will come back. Uh, and last but not least, we talked about overly complex. If it's more than an eight complexity count, um, the decision as to whether or not it's acceptable will be made on the basis of one of two things. It's either um, attested to in an IAP or it is um, ruled that while it's technically complex, it is not visually complex. We are going to uh, talk a little bit about conflict because if you are the consulting herald and you do not take conflict into account, you have not done uh, your complete job. So when we talk about conflict, um, we're talking about not being so similar to registered armory that you could be confused with somebody else. And these are the rules for uh, conflict and clearing of conflict. Uh, the first rule is um, that you can be considered clear of all registered heraldry through what's called a single substantial change or SC. Uh, most commonly applied in the cases of simple heraldry, um, a substantial change would be, for example, a complete difference of primary charge. So uh, for example, let's say that you have uh, a black field with a white lion rampant on it. Uh, you would not conflict with somebody that had a black field with a white bear rampant on it. Even though that's only one change, the change from lion to bear, um, because the animal is a single primary charge and the change was from one genus to another, uh, from canine to ursine, uh, that is considered a substantial change. And so those two devices do not conflict. If you do not clear by a single substantial change, you can still be clear of conflict if you have a combination of two distinct changes. A distinct change is a change that is defined as uh, being a cadency change. So uh, cadency is where uh, I have, say, two sons, uh, and I take my arms, a uh, yellow background with a green acorn inside a ring of green oak leaves. Um, and when I die, um, those arms would be willed to my son, who would then take up those arms as his own. My second son would, pro uh, would get those arms with a difference, a cadency difference. So one cadency difference might be changing the acorn from green to blue. A cadency difference might be adding a secondary charge, uh, say, in chief. Uh, very common to add something like a crescent uh, in chief in order to difference the arms. Uh, it might be to change the ring of oak leaves to an oral of oak leaves. Um, anything that, that changes 
uh, the similarity enough to differentiate between the two brothers uh, is a cadency change. And if you have two such uh, distinct changes, you are clear of conflict with the other armory. Um, so to use our sable lion rampant argent uh, as an example, um, I would conflict with sable a lion rampant argent uh, within a board year or uh, because the only distinct change that I have is the addition of the border. Um, I could do a couple of things. I could change the color of my lion to yellow. I could change the color of the background to uh, purple, red, green, or blue. Um, or I could add a border myself, but make the border... Um, no, I couldn't add a border. I could add another ordinary, um, such as a, uh, uh, a flaunch uh, or a tears in order to uh, further differentiate it. Even that wouldn't work because that would still only be one distinct change. Um, I could make the field a complex field, so divided per pale, per fess. So any difference that I make to the field or any difference that I make to the primary charge would be the second distinct change in addition to uh, the, uh, the border being the first distinct change. Um, relationship conflict. Relationship conflict is where your arms look too similar. Even though you might be technically clear, uh, you might have your two distinct changes, you might be uh, 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 completely clear of conflict, but um, your arms look too similar and um, it appears uh, as though you might be related to the person um, with the other arms. Now this is a very, very rare uh, type of conflict. Uh, the only time that I remember seeing it is when both the arms and the name were similar. Uh, so the individual had the same last name uh, as the other person uh, with whom they were uh, comparing. Um, and because the arms and the name were, were both similar, uh, it became a relationship conflict. Uh, but uh, it is possible, um, theoretically, to get a relationship conflict. Uh, in arms that are technically uh, clear with each other, simply because of the uh, massive similarity between two designs. Uh, visual conflict is where you are technically clear, but you look the same. So a visual conflict, um, we used to call it the outline conflict, uh, where if you had an exact uh, duplicate of an outline um, as somebody else's armory, um, you, you conflicted with them. Uh, they changed that rule because outline conflict um, essentially meant that nobody could have the exact same outline. Uh, it blocked all tincture combinations uh, for a particular design. Um, but visual conflicts uh, generally occur um, not so much when, uh, when the designs are exactly the same uh, or, or very, very similar. Technically, it, it's when they, they look similar. And it happens sometimes when you have, uh, uh, say, animals they are drawn in their period style, um, but perhaps uh, because they're secondary charges, uh, it can be difficult to tell the difference between uh, canines and felines um, drawn in their heraldic uh, uh, patterns when um, uh, when the charge is very very small. So you uh, uh, or you might have some very minor change like a, a small tertiary on a peripheral ordinary um, that uh, is just not uh, as evident uh, when you look at it from the twenty to one. Uh, in which case you're probably dealing with uh, inability to identify the charge, but it may also drive a visual conflict. Again, very, very rare uh, to find something kicked back for, for either a relationship conflict or a visual conflict. Uh, if you do find yourself in conflict with somebody else, um, there are two ways to go about um, fixing that problem. One is to modify your design to get 
the appropriate separation. Um, when you do that, you have to be careful that you don't um, clear one conflict, but create another one. Um, you can also try contacting the owner of the registered armory that you conflict with and ask them if you can have permission to conflict. Um, this used to be very, very common um, 20, 30 years ago, um, not so much anymore. Uh, and part of the reason why I don't encourage uh, seeking letters of permission to conflict uh, is twofold. Uh, the first is that uh, heraldry in the SCA, registered heraldry is prolific enough uh, right now where granting permission to conflict is tantamount to recognizing a relationship. Um, if, if it's a point of difference away from somebody else's registered arms, um, that single point of cadency in granting you permission to conflict, I may actually be um, setting up uh, the impression that you and I are somehow related. Um, but the other reason is because we're, we're 54 years old. Uh, the College of Arms has been around for half a, a century. And a lot of the conflicts that we find are heraldry registered in the 70s, 80s, and even the early 90s, where the individual that owns that armory may not even be playing in the SCA anymore. And increasingly, we're finding that the owners of older registered heraldry have actually died. Um, one of the things in the SCA that's uh, different in the real world is in the SCA, everybody can register their own device regardless of what their parents' arms are. In, in medieval history, oldest person, oldest son inherited their father's arms, second son inherited it with a single difference, and those arms would be uh, in use in perpetuity unless the, the line actually ended. Um, in the SCA, that's not necessarily true. There are some people out there that adopt variations of their parents' arms, but it's not common enough that um, um, that the there's going to be a living owner uh, of that registered device or badge uh, able to give a letter of permission to conflict. And you can waste a lot of time trying to find somebody um, who may not be able to be found. Uh, last but not least, the issue on conflict, we talked about it when we talked about fieldless badges. Fieldless counts as one DC from everything due to change in the field. So if you have a fieldless badge, you only have to clear conflict by one other uh, distinct change. How do we do a conflict check, you might ask? Funny you should ask. We actually have an online armorial and ordinary. Um, the uh, Laurel staff has uh, some experts that have put together a searchable index um, that is uh, able to be used to look up registered arms and devices. And this is kind of what uh, the start page looks like. So let's go back to the device that uh, I mentioned earlier, Sable, a lion rampant argent. Um, let's say that I want to look up lions. So I would go to L and uh, find lion, right? Lion, oh no, I wouldn't. Look what it says under lion. C, beast, cat. Huh, wonder if there's a beast dog. Look at that, there's a beast dog. Beast elephant, beast goat. Yes, any animal you wanna look up in the armorial and ordinary is going to come under the header of beast. All cats are cats, whether it's a lion, a tiger or a house cat. Uh, so they're all going to be under beast cat. So I've got an Argent uh, lion and he's rampant. So look, beast cat one Argent rampant. And there are 209 registered pieces of armory in the SCA Armorial and Ordinary that have a lion rampant Argent or some other type of cat that have a feline rampant Argent. Um, I really don't want to look at 209 um, 
entries to see if I conflict with any of them. So what can I do? Ha ha. The SCA also gives us a complex search form. Let's see what this looks like. A complex search form that works with actual scoring criteria. So how would I use the complex search form? Well, let's look at our lion rampant argent. Um, So I'm going to take my, my desired entry, and I am going to say that I want a black field. I want a lion rampant argent, and I want a border argent wrapped around it. So I can simply go to that armorial description and I clicked on, as you saw, I clicked on Beast Cat 1 Argent Rampant and it gave me a data code. Cat colon rampant colon argent colon 1. So I go to the complex search form and I enter cat colon as my um, root entry. And then I set my three criteria as three separate entries on that form. So I have cat rampant, uh, cat argent, and cat one. I can actually also put in cat sole primary because I only have one cat and it's the sole primary. So before adding the border, I actually can search just on that criteria, and my 209 lions or cats rampant argent is now actually reduced because I said it's got to be the sole primary, has been reduced down to 120 matching items. So I, I've cut 80, uh, 89 items off of my list of things that I actually have to search on. Now let's go back because I want to put an argent border on it. And um, if I want a, a border, I go to B for border. And I just want a plain line border. I don't want any tertiaries on the border. So we're going to look for a border uncharged, plain line, argent. And because it's around a single lion, I'm going to look at border, uncharged, plain line, argent, surrounding one only. So let's copy and paste that into my weighted search function here. I apologize for the phone ringing in the background. So we're going to look on border surrounding one only, border Argent, I'm supposed to be on a no call list, but it doesn't stop them from calling until you tell them to stop. And you have to answer the phone in order to make that happen. So border plain line. And finally, <coughs> border uncharged. So I have four criteria for my cat and I have four criteria for my border. And I hit that, let me pull that out of the way there. I hit that search for items matching the above criteria button. And remember, I had 120 just with the cat. And because I have eight criteria here, I am looking for, and I have to have two distinct changes. I am looking for anything uh, with uh, eight or seven matching items. So right off the bat, well, here are four matching items with a score of eight and 22 matching items with a score of seven. So now I only have to look at the actual blazons for 
26 different devices in order to determine if I have a conflict. So let's look at this first one, Guillaume Levet. Uh, per bend is joules and sable. So right off the bat, I am a sable field only. He is a divided field. So that's one DC. A winged lion, rampant guardant, and a border argent. Okay, so the border argent is the same. The lion rampant is the same, but this lion is winged. And we have a precedent in the SCA that says that a winged beast is a distinct change from a non-winged beast. So there's my two distinct changes. Guillaume is not a conflict. Number two, Duncan von Halstern. Per pale, per pure, and sable. So right off the bat, I am a sable-only field. He is a divided field, purple and sable, and therefore I have one DC. A lion, now remember that a lion's default posture is rampant. So I have a lion and a border, plain line, uncharged, Harjan. So we have the exact same device, except his has a half purple field and mine field is all black. That's only one distinct change, not a substantive change, and therefore that is a conflict. I can stop right there and kick that device back for conflict with Duncan von Halstern. Because um, I'm gonna have to make a change anyway. Uh, I can turn the line around so that he's facing the other way. I can put a complex line on the border. Uh, I can put tertiary charges on the border. I can put secondary charges on the field. A uh, number of different things that I can use in order to change, um, to get two steps from Duncan von Halstern. And then I can redo the conflict check uh, using the new design criteria. Um, ordinarily, um, I would still go ahead and look at, at Sonia and Robin here to make sure that I'm not uh, in conflict with either of those two um, so that I could tailor my changes uh, to avoid additional conflict. Um, but because I hit a conflict under matching score of eight, I'm not going to bother looking at the 22 of the matching score of seven. So that is a down and dirty conflict check um, using the online forms uh, that are available. Um, as the consulting herald, um, you also have the ability uh, to go out to Facebook, to the unofficial SCA heraldry chat uh, group on, on Facebook. You can throw up a, uh, an emblazon of the device or badge there and say, I'm requesting a conflict check. And you can get a bunch of volunteers who will uh, do uh, complex checks for you. Um, understand that when you do a conflict check, the conflict check is only valid that day. Um, because if you do a conflict check and then three months later you submit your forms, somebody else might have registered something uh, in the interim uh, that would bring you into conflict. So you will not know 100% for certain until you actually submit your uh, forms uh, and get them published on a letter of intent. Common fixes to avoid conflict. Uh, change of tincture, orientation, or posture. Orientation is generally for non-animate objects and posture for animate objects. Um, but a change of tincture, orientation, or posture is generally one distinct change. There are some exceptions. Uh, for instance, there are certain postures that are considered variations of each other. Um, one example is rampant, which is two feet on, uh, or one foot on the ground. Uh, one hind foot raised, uh, standing upright with the two forelegs uh, waving around in the air. Salient is the exact same thing, but both back feet are firmly planted on the ground. They are considered variations of each other and therefore conflict with each other. Um, and you do not get a difference for change of the orientation of just the head. So making a beast to guardant or regardant um, does not uh, fix conflict. Addition of complex line of division. Uh, if, uh, if you have per pale uh, jewels and sable, uh, and you have uh, per pale indented jewels and sable, that is one distinct change. 
Um, that complex line also works for simple geometric shapes and ordinaries, uh, which are considered a distinct change with the addition of a complex line. Uh, addition or removal of an ordinary. Uh, my mentor back when I was a young herald, uh, we would sit there uh, on submission uh, nights uh, in her living room and we would find a conflict uh, on a submission that somebody had mailed in. And uh, she would immediately stick her finger in the air and yell, throw a border on it. Um, because you would find that one distinct change, but you couldn't find that second one. So adding a border, adding a chief, adding a base or a point or flaunches or some other type of peripheral ordinary um, will uh, generally add that second distinct change. Um, you have to be careful when you talk about adding central ordinaries, uh, particularly if you have a single primary charge, because then you have to deal with uh, the issue of overall uh, considerations. Addition or removal of secondary or tertiary charges or charge groups. Um, for instance, Duncan von Alstern. So my sable, a lion, and a border argent conflicted with Duncan von Alstern. Uh, sable, a lion, and a border argent. Um, I could change my lion to yellow, and I could add a sprinkle of black dots on my argent border. Uh, the sprinkle of black dots on the argent border is a tertiary charge. Um, I could also add, say, three fleur de lis, uh, two in the uh, upper corners and one in the in the base around the lion. That would be the addition of a secondary charge group. Uh, so the addition or removal of secondary tertiary charge groups uh, definitely works but also the addition or removal of individual charges. So if I did have the three fleur de lis around the lion and come to find out that that causes a conflict with somebody other than Duncan von Holster, um, I could take away one of the three fleur de lis and just, just leave the two in chief with the lion slightly displaced down and the uh, removal of that one secondary charge means that my two secondaries are no longer in conflict with somebody else's three secondaries. And that's where we get the change in the number of charges in a charge group. Um, now, caution with that, um, seven being the lucky number, up to about seven, you can get a difference for changing the number, but the more you have, the less difference you get. So changing from one to two or two to three, um, or even in some cases, three to four, uh, generally results in a uh, distinct change. Uh, going from four to six or five to seven would be a distinct change. But in some cases, four to five or five to six might not be. Um, above seven, we stop counting. So eight of something and 16 of something, still a conflict. So that's the down and dirty uh, on conflict checking. Um, actually, I will go into uh, a little bit more detail when we start talking about uh, commentary in uh, the online system for commenting and response uh, or OSCAR. Uh, I do have a companion video on uh, how to do um, substantive commentary uh, within the Oscar system. And I will be talking more about conflict and resolving conflict in that video as well. So I encourage you uh, to look up my other videos uh, in this series. And uh, I also encourage you, if you wanna see this class in person where you have the opportunity to ask questions, uh, I will be offering this class periodically in Ethelmark Academies. Uh, and at Ethel Mark Herald's and Scribes events uh, in the future. So until then, I will see you later.